Should I start? Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Xiang Yi, an in-house editor of Physical Review A. Welcome to the second interview of PRA behind the research webinar series. Uh, first, um, an announcement from the newest member of our um, Physical Review family, PRX Quantum. PRX Quantum is a highly selective open access journal designed for quantum information community. It is now open for submissions, and we're happy to announce that the APS will pay the article processing charge until 2022. This year marks the 50th year anniversary of Physical Review A. 50 years ago, Physical Review A, B, C, and D split from the original Physical Review Journal. To celebrate this important moment, we have a few initiatives. First, we're continuing highlighting milestone papers that publish in the history of Physical Review A. I encourage you to check back to our website and check the latest updates to this collection. Also, the APS Physics Magazine published a nice article highlighting three of our classic papers. The PIA behind the research webinar series is yet another opportunity to highlight some of the most influential papers in the history of PRA. Last week, we had a successful interview with Dr. Sarak, and this is our second one. Our third interview is scheduled on August the 5th. Uh, we'll have Dr. Asiyaj Lewinston and Dr. Misha Ivanov talk about their influential paper, Theory of High Harmonic Generation by Low Frequency Laser Fumes. And you can register for this event now. And today we're honored to have Dr. Michael Fleshauer and Dr. Misha Looking talking about their seminal work, Quantum Memory for Photons, Dark State Protons, published in 2002 in PRA. We're also glad to have Dr. Mark Suffman as our interviewer today. Dr. Suffman is a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison. and He works on cold atoms, quantum optics, and their applications in quantum information. Dr. Suffman has been an associate editor for PRA since 2007, so many of you are very familiar with him now. Before the interview, I would like to remind you that you can ask questions at any time by entering your question to the control panel of the GoToWebinar application. There is a question tab and a blank box under that tab. If you want to ask the question in person, please add live to the beginning of your question. We'll select which question to address after the interview. If you opt to ask the question in person, I will address the individual questioners by name and unmute you so that you can speak. Now, let's welcome Dr. Mark Suffman and he's going to introduce our guest today. Thank you, Zhang Yu. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guests today, Mikhail Fleischauer and Misha Lukin. Let me start by telling you something, just a little bit about them and their research and roles in the quantum science communities. Uh, you should be able to see uh, Mikhail Fleischauer. Misha Lukin had some computer troubles and will be on the audio, but his uh, image is not available. But I think most of us know what he looks like nonetheless. So um, Mikhail and Misha have both been very active leaders in the fields of quantum optics and quantum information and have both been at the forefront of developments for the last 25 to 30 years. Mikhail Fleischauer is a professor of physics at the Technical University of Kaiserslautern. He runs a theoretical quantum optics research group, and he's been behind many groundbreaking results in quantum optics, interaction of light and atoms, as well as other nonlinear media and quantum information. 
Uh, he's published prolifically, and I was looking up on the Physical Review website, which covers all of the Physical Review journals. He's published 150 papers in the Physical Review alone. So he's been a very active researcher for many years. Uh, Misha Lukin is a professor of physics at Harvard University. His group uh, is called the Quantum Optics Laboratory, and he has had uh, many pioneering advances in quantum optics, quantum computing, quantum networking with atoms, photons, solid state media, and V centers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, personally, I'm very appreciative of his work. Uh, his early ideas on Rydberg blockade have set the agenda for myself and my research group for, for several decades now. He's also a very prolific author and uh, in the physical review journals alone, he's published the astounding number of 248 papers. So, so both Mikhail and Misha, who we welcome, have been very active uh, with the physical review and we're very happy to, to highlight their work today. So today we're celebrating 50 years of physical review A, but this uh, particular presentation is really a story of two papers. There was a PRL in 2000 uh, called Dark State Polaritons and Electromagnetically Induced Transparency, and that was published in May 2000. And then that was followed on by the long PRA, which appeared uh, about a year and a half later in January 2002, called Quantum Memory for Photons, Dark State Polaritons. So just to start out here, and I should also say both of those papers have been cited many, many times. You can look up the numbers on Google Scholar, for example, about a thousand citations to the uh, PRA paper. Let me start out by asking uh, Mikhail and Misha to um, perhaps describe in your own words what the central physics idea of the dark state polariton is and why it has been so important for the field of quantum optics. So either one. Yeah, okay, I, uh, I, I could start. Uh, I guess the, the uh, whole story did, uh, I mean, uh, it developed into a tool for quantum information, but that's, that was not the original, uh, the original set. So uh, I, both uh, Misha and I had worked in the early 90s together with Martin Scully's group on, on uh, optical properties of, of resonant media. And uh, I mean, typically if you have a resonant medium, you, you, get, uh, uh, you get either absorption a strong absorption, or if you have a pi pulse or something like this, and then of course a pulse can can propagate. But uh, then came this idea, which had been uh, proposed by by Steve Harris in the in the in the 90s, late 80s, and early 90s, for electromagnetic induced transparency, where now suddenly you could make a resonant medium uh, transparent. And uh, along with that, because it's a, a near resonance phenomena, so things happen close to, to certain resonances. Uh, associated with that was, was uh, a, a strong dispersive effect uh, resulting in, in small group velocities. And so I, I remember in, this, uh, in the times in the late uh, 90s, there was, uh, or, well, actually over whole the, the 90s, there was a lot of work in, in uh, uh, Martin's, uh, Martin Scully's group and uh, uh, Steve Harris' group on who gets the smallest group velocity in, in, the, in, uh, in, in, in several media. So there were seminal experimental works in, in Steve's group and Marlin's group and in Dima Butka's group and in, in the late 90s, uh, Lena House uh, a group, which showed this uh, uh, dramatic reduction of, of, uh, of the group velocity. And, uh, but uh, then uh, I guess at some point that the question came, so what's the limit? I mean, how far can you go with that? And uh, then there is uh, one has to to remember that that what's what's going to happen is that that uh, uh, you burn uh, a narrow spectral hole in an absorption line, and uh, the narrower the hole, the uh, smaller the group velocity. So uh, apparently, if you really wanted to go to very small values, you would have to make the spectrum very narrow. And then it tells you immediately that you have to use uh, very long pulses. And, uh, and the pulses, which are much longer than, than, than any, any gaseous medium. Uh, and uh, so it was somehow cl clear that uh, one couldn't do, one couldn't go to the, to the, to the ultimate limit. Um, while there were some 
some uh, uh, some positive results because uh, uh, Steve and, and Lena were showing that once you send the pulse into a medium with a reduced group velocity, it actually spatially shrinks. It's a very simple kinematic uh, effect. If the front end of the pulse is inside and the, the, the back end is still outside, it just gets gets compressed. Uh, so that is good. So the, so the length of the pulse would maybe fit in the medium, but still you have the problem if you wanted to make the velocity smaller and smaller, the spectrum gets, the, 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 the allowed spectrum a uh, 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 spectral window would get narrower and narrower, and uh, th then uh, it, it seemed that at one point that that thing should stop. And and I I guess that was the starting point where we thought about, well, if you slightly change the story and uh, make this uh, uh, group velocity change dynamically, then then the whole uh, story changes. And then suddenly uh, we realized that that uh, the the process which is behind this slow light is nothing else than the transfer of photonic excitation into some sort of medium, effective medium excitation. And, and this is an, an adiabatic uh, falling process. So it can be made back and forth. And that, that then uh, basically was, I think, this the starting point of, of thinking about uh, um, uh, uh, making complete uh, light uh, stopping. And, uh, and and that had led to this uh, uh, 2000 paper, and uh, then the, the PRA, which was a uh, follow-up on that. Uh, and I think the, the, the most fascinating for me thing in, in that connection was that, that uh, uh, essentially Misha's group was able to make uh, an experimental verification of that on a very short time scale after the, 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 uh, we had published the theory paper. And uh, um, well, but maybe, Misha, you want to say something there and continue there? Yeah, so I can actually add maybe a kind of another kind of interesting element for this um, uh, story. So uh, the actual idea um, to kind of start working kind of in this direction to really explore the the use of this kind of stopped, you know, stopping basically, you know, pulse and you know, at the same time mapping the information which is carried out by the pulse of light into atoms originated, um, I think, in the summer of uh, 1999, yeah. uh, when um, uh, uh, our uh, thesis advisor um, and, you know, in Michael's case, um, uh, postdoc advisor Marlon Scarley had a 60th year birthday. And uh, and there was a very nice birthday party in Germany, and actually, um, uh, basically, um, you know, I, I was not able to attend this meeting, you know, because guess what? Because of the visa uh, issue. So that's maybe is very relevant to many of the students today. And actually, and and. Uh, uh, um, another person involved in that was actually uh, uh, Susanna Yellen, um, and you know, basically, you know, free, and you know, three of us, you know, uh, myself, Susanna, and, and Michael, uh, we felt, you know, because at least in my case and Susanna's case, we were not able to actually go to the to this, you know, uh, Marlon's birthday celebration. Uh, we felt that we should really write some, you know, special paper for this, you know, special issue, uh, kind of celebrating Marlon's kind of science. And uh, of course, you know, we were way, I mean, the deadline was basically, you know, already over and, you know, you know, we were at the time postdocs, you know, you typically would kind of, you know, uh, not write a kind of fast shift papers in this kind of position. You know, but then basically, you know, we really had to come up with something to, you know, to uh, to contribute to that. And actually, that's how originally the idea of this kind of uh, uh, stopped light and kind of mapping, you know, the you know pulse of light, the information carried in the pulse of light into these uh, atoms have actually been started. And you know, so. Uh, that then what you know we kind of did write a you know a very short uh, contribution to the uh, to Marlon's birthday you know, special issue and then uh, we followed up with the PRL uh, with basically you know uh, 
um, you know, uh, three of us. And then eventually, you know, we started kind of exploring and understanding deeper connections to this, for example, uh, physics of EIT, about what happens actually exactly with the piles, what's the special temporal dynamics, you know, and this is actually the material which uh, which uh, uh, which ended up in, in, in the physical review paper, which was actually, you know, kind of very important, very useful also for subsequent experiments and actually Understand partially based on this understanding, we were able to actually make a, a demonstration of this effect very, very quickly, and that you know how this field was started. Th Thank you, Misha. You very nicely anticipated what would have been my next question, which which was how specifically this joint work came about. But um, that that was uh, fun to hear that story. Um, you know, one question I want to ask is. Uh, there was a gap of about a year and a half between the PRL appearing and the follow-up PRA. That's a relatively long gap for, for the two of you who have written so many papers. Uh, why such a gap? Were you busy with other projects, specific challenges in the research, or, or just wanting to, to get everything nailed down? Any comment on that? Well, uh, it's, I certainly can comment on my side. Uh, in 2000, I uh, was uh, uh, in, in, in Harvard on a, uh, on a fellowship and uh, I got uh, a call to uh, Kaiserslautern actually in, in, in 2000. So I basically moved places and, and uh, uh, before you get started in a, new, in a new place, it always takes a little, little time. But I wouldn't say that that's that much uh, time delay because the the paper was uh, sent to PRA in June 2001, so it's uh, it's a year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so I, fair enough. You know, okay. Yeah, you know, maybe I can add that. I think that was actually, in a way, that was a very healthy kind of you know delay in between these two you know papers, and it was for multiple reasons. So first of all. Uh, it kind of took us some time to actually understand the physics, you know, why this, you know, kind of effect works like it does, you know, and that's actually at the end, you know, this kind of, you know, that's probably why people read this paper because it actually describes this, this physics in a way which is kind of accessible and, and intuitive, you know. In parallel, we actually already at the time, we realized a lot of, you know, potential implications of this kind of effects and, you know, uh, and that means that we were busy writing other papers as well. So, <laughs> okay. So, I, I mean, as you've mentioned, the uh, experimental dis demonstrations followed actually very quickly after the PRL and as the PRA was being published, uh, both in Lena Howe's lab using sodium atoms uh, close to the BC threshold, and uh, both of you on the paper with Ron Walsworth and others. Uh, from Harvard Smithsonian using hot rubidium vapor. And um, you know, one question is, did those very early experiments uh, reveal some surprises that you had not anticipated in the PRA or suggested much further analysis later on? So, so I guess there is also a story about this kind of development. So, and so basically what you know what what happened at, at the time you know when we had this kind of started developing these ideas and writing these theory papers um uh, uh you know you know both basically actually all three of us at the time including Mikael and Susanna we were all basically at you know at the ITAP uh, at, at, at Harvard uh, Institute for Theoretical Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics and uh and, you know, and, um, you know, we were actually quite excited about that. And, you know, in uh, in the conversations, it's actually we realized that, you know, in principle, to really carry a proof of uh, concept experiment to demonstrate it should not be too, too hard, you know. And then um, during that time at Titan, there was a tradition, there was like an afternoon coffee and, you know, various people, you know, stopped by and actually, one day, Ron, Wals Ron Walsworth, who um, was at the time a physicist at CFA, you know, stopped for a coffee. And, you know, we were talking about that and he was kind of, you know, he heard these discussions and, you know, he participated. And actually, you know, during this afternoon, we basically realized that in principle, you know, 
you know, he has in his lab, you know, all components which would be need to do this experiment, you know, and um, uh, and in fact, we were able to, you know, to basically, you know, do this demonstration, you know, very quickly over the course of just maybe, you know, kind of a, a couple of months. And I think what the surprise was, uh, and actually then during that time, we also learned that Lina has been working about this on, on this kind of, uh, um, a demonstration also basically across the town um, and you know what the, the surprise was that this basically method was just extremely robust that it basically worked almost the first time that we tried and this you know does not always happen with experiments you know so that's a... okay. um, yeah, we'll another question that. actually Go ahead. That, that one of the most surprises for me, at least at that time, was that that, it, uh, that we were able to do it in such a short time and it worked on a relatively low budget, as, as Misha said. I mean, there were no uh, no new board uh, equipment, at least not that I that I remember or that I know of. Probably there was some some part, but but not on, on a, any major things. So so that was really. I mean, typically in an experiment, when you try it the first time. It, doesn't really work and and then this this worked and that was quite nice I have to make a little comment though because you said that we both were on this experimental paper that was actually my wife that's not me so just as a comment ah I was going to ask about that who was this other person who I have not met but that's your wife okay okay so let me then ask you know if you think back about it um, did you expect at the time how significant this work was going to be? Have you been surprised by the success and the the impact of this dark state polariton concept? Was, was that obvious at the time that it was going to be very significant? Well, not, I mean, no, I don't think so. I mean, at the beginning it was, uh, uh, we, I mean, at least from my side, I think I knew that that we had found something interesting, but as long as it just was a theory paper, it was nice and, and good to have, and certainly I, I, I was proud of having uh, found a nice effect. But the real breakthrough uh, came came certainly with the with the experimental demonstration, which showed that it that it uh, uh, works uh, so robustly and and uh, nicely. Of course, we also discovered the uh, uh the limitations and in, in 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 the in the experiments and that was sort of uh, maybe one of the things which we looked a little bit more careful into in this pra paper was trying to understand uh, what are really the conditions uh, to make this thing uh, working beyond this ideal uh, situation and uh, um but uh so after the first theory paper i certainly did not anticipate this this, this move now. So actually, maybe I can add a little bit, you know, I have a little bit kind of different perspective. So, I mean, it is of course impossible when you do some work to kind of, to judge its impact. It is, you know, it, it's never, it's never possible. But there were actually a few things which I, I, I think was, were kind of clear is, you know, one is that, you know, there were, at the time, there were already kind of, you know, a number of groups around the world kind of thinking about this quantum memory kind of ideas and how to kind of implement this, these techniques and so on. So it was actually clear, I, I, you know, as far as I remember for us, and that's why we were so excited about that, about that, that kind of result, um, was that, you know, this approach would be technically much simpler. Uh, at least kind of in the near term, you know, and that's why we decided, that's why actually we decided to kind of try to do this experiment, you know, and, uh, uh, and at least that this kind of, you know, this is one of these cases where one could indeed, you know, show something with, you know, conceptual, with, you know, just a clever idea, with kind of re relatively simple experimental apparatus. But I actually would like to maybe add that, you know, right around that time, it was also, it also became clear that this idea of using, you know, collective excitations to store, um, for example, quanta of light in, or information which is stored in quanta of light, you know, could potentially be very, very powerful. And actually, um, 
uh, in fact, the work that that Mark mentioned, you know, um, earlier on involving Rydberg, Rydberg atoms for quantum information processing was in, in part inspired by this by these ideas on on polaritons because we started thinking about oh how, how can you make you know these collective excitations interact you know um, and um, Rydberg atom was you know kind of exciting atom to Rydberg states were um, uh, you know you know was a way how we've kind of you know started thinking about that in fact the idea of Rydberg blockade you know kind of you can credit to sort of being inspired by this by by this uh, you know paper on 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 basically slowing and storing um, uh, photons. So there were other directions. For example, the, um, the the work on on quantum repeaters, which is now often called a DLCZ protocol, was also directly inspired by this by this early uh, uh, work. So that was actually an exciting time at the time. So you know. And you know both kind of early experiments and a lot of theoretical ideas, and you know some of them, you know, we are still harvesting, you know, this kind of you know things which were put forward. But of course, it kind of for some of them, it also you know took you know took two decades to really kind of you know uh, come to the fruition. So right, I mean, maybe, I think that can I, maybe I can, can add one one more thing there. Um, I think, uh, from from a theory point of view, uh, uh, since uh, the the this business of of uh, uh, transferring light into polaritons is just was just a linear process, it was sort of clear for us that it should hold also on the on the quant in the quantum world. But of course, the first experiments were all done with with classical light pulses. Uh, uh, yet uh, we we knew that it would hold for for uh, uh, purposes like like storing uh, quantum information. But it took a while, a couple of years, uh, before then the first experiments actually proved this. Uh, and I remember, I think, uh, 2005 or, uh, or something like this, uh, around that time, uh, where the first experiments would actually showed that uh, that the the uh, um, for for uh, single photon pulses could really be stored and, and, and released. So the original theory work was written in a sense was written in the context of light interacting with atoms but of course the hamiltonians are much more general and uh, people may and in fact have demonstrated this polariton concept in other media solid state media uh, would either of you have any comments or thoughts about um, uh, the potential of uh, these techniques using other media and also you know there are uh, limits to the storage time and the fidelity with which one can use the uh, dark state polariton concept. Do you see uh, perhaps other media um, surpassing the performance achieved with atomic media? Any thoughts about that? I think it was clear from the very beginning that that uh, and the nice thing about an atomic medium is of course the, the, the clear structure, the sim simplicity of the of the interaction process, but uh, but uh, the, the, it was the, the from the very early days on was the idea of going into some sort of solid state medium. And the first thing which comes into mind uh, are artificial atoms in a solid state environment. Uh, and and this has been uh, 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 this has been put uh, pushed forward then then afterwards by by, by many by many groups and and a couple of records like the longest storage times were actually done in in uh, solid state environments uh, i mean these are all still i would say uh, uh, uh solid state uh, uh, realizations which are close to atomic physics um like in these centers like like uh, 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 uh color centers and and uh, and, and others um uh, uh uh, but uh, no, no. So, I mean, so, certainly, they, 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 this pushed the the the, uh, the, the field quite a lot, and um, th that is definitely the, the, the way to go. Yeah, I, I maybe also add that you know certainly you know I, I feel that kind of atomic physics still continues to lead the kind of way in this in this sort of domain of in this subfield and 
I mean, in fact, if you start thinking about, you know, how, you know, how this kind of method, you know, uh, has been used, let's say, for, you know, kind of interesting science or, or, or applications, I mean, a lot of these experiments, like, for example, you know, combining this light slowing or storage with, you know, strong photon-photon interactions, for example, mediated by exciting into, into the Rydberg atoms, right? These kind of experiments, you know, are still done in the atomic systems, and, you know, I think they continue to be done, and, you know, I, I, I trust also, for example, for applications like quantum networking, I think that, you know, I mean, this is definitely uh, remains a kind of, I would say, leading, you know, platform. Atomic systems remain the leading platform. But actually, at the same time, there are a couple of directions where this work was extended, which really we could absolutely not have anticipated kind of when we were writing, you know, these early papers. And this is kind of even more like, you know, uh, here I, I'm talking about more like the, con the conceptual level, you know, so for example, already kind of in the mid 2000 people started experimenting by creating this kind of slow light structures, basically artificially by making kind of micro and nanophotonic devices, you know, and basically by changing the properties of these devices, you could also you know, try to kind of manipulate a group velocity, kind of very much inspired by these ideas. And, you know, at some point, um, uh, I think scientists at, you know, IBM even had like a program to sort of use this effect to basically kind of interface electronic and optical kind of chips in the classical, in the classical domain. Another direction where these ideas of controlling group, group velocity actually play a role are ideas involving um, quantum optic mechanics, uh, where the system and you know physical system is very very different, but it actually turns out the physics is very similar. So a lot of these kind of ideas which people now ex ex exploring in this actually very exciting field, in a way, are related to this kind of early you know things that we were tinkering with, and you know twenty years ago. Okay. Thank you. So I think soon I will turn this over to any questions we may have from the audience. But before that, I have one final question going back to the uh, 2002 PRA paper. So that paper originally appeared on the archive with a just slightly different title and that it said uh, quantum memory for photons, one dark state polaritons, and also inside the paper, also in the published PRA. Uh, paper, there's a, several references to there will be subsequent papers analyzing additional aspects. And as far as I know, that subsequent paper never came out, and the part one was indeed dropped from the PRA title. Perhaps that was an overzealous editor, I don't know. But uh, can we expect a part two anytime soon? <laughs> Well, at the beginning, you asked why it took so long between the, the, the time of the PRL and the PRA. I mean, part of the story is, of course, that we realized that, that some of the things which we maybe planned for successive papers were interesting enough to just uh, put an added to, to, uh, uh, to that paper. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I don't recall the story uh, uh, in, in all details anymore. But I remember that we uh, originally uh, wanted to split this and then decided that, that uh, it, it's actually nicer to have it in, 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 in one uh, uh, row. Um, uh, can you expect more papers uh, from us? Certainly, but it would be memory for photons type uh, two. Maybe, I don't know. But I think part of what, what has happened is that, you know, again, I guess that's what we were kind of a little bit unexpected, that there was all of a sudden a lot of interest in this, in this work. And we kind of saw, you know, like many people are following up, I mean, including some papers you Mark wrote, you know, and, you know, and we were like, wow, you know, so, and, you know, we did continue working on this. And for example, there was a series of papers which um, Alexei uh, Gorshkov, uh, um kind of you know you know you know after and, and led and actually so at the time he was kind of uh um just starting in my group as a graduate student and i basically gave him like a warm-up you know problem oh, can you look into this and try to see if you can optimize it and you know basically the entire new kind of direction you know 
started from that. So I, I think, you know, we did follow up, maybe not in exactly in a way how we um, expected that, but you know, that's how science develops, right? So you, you know, you make a step and you know, you open new territory and you know, you might not expect what is to come, right? And that's a little bit what happened here. I, I think that's right. And I think that's also uh, probably a good uh, point to move along and see if we have any uh, questions from uh, any of the people listening. And I think that goes back to you, Zhang Yu. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Um, I'm just going to read it out. Uh, the formation, a formulation of light storage via dark state protons predicts a perfect retrieval of the temporal shape of the incident powers. Could you comment if storage and retrieval, a retrieval of arbitrary temporal paths shapes have been demonstrated experimentally? Okay, so I, I guess the first comment to make is that, uh, of course, later on we we have uh, realized that that this uh, arbitrary is not as arbitrary as 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 is maybe stated there, and the the, the work of uh, Alexei uh, Goshkov and and uh, uh, also uh, elaborated on that. Um, so uh, I mean, the, the the point is that as long as the spectral width of your of the incoming pulse fits in the transparency window of the of the uh, of the material at the beginning uh, it, it, to, the, to that extent it's arbitrary uh, but of course the spectral width of the of the medium is is narrow because it's in it's in close to resonance phenomena so uh, we can one can certainly not uh, uh, consider to to store pulses with shapes which have have very high frequency components it this will not work um, and uh, then uh, uh, the, this ideal mapping actually uh, is, is true if uh, the, uh, one of the properties of the medium, which is called the optical depth, if, if, if that is uh, extremely high, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, one of course realizes that, that one cannot turn this optical depth to arbitrary large values. So as, long, as soon as you work with finite optical depths, there's always a distortion uh, of, the, uh, of the pulse because high frequency components, essentially what's going to happen is that high frequency components are eaten up. So therefore, the pulse will, will uh, smoothen. Uh, however, uh, modifying the protocol, the, the retrieval protocol, you can actually also change the pulse shape of the outgoing pulse, again, within these limitations, which, which, I, which I mentioned. But I think yeah, that yeah, yeah, there were experiments demonstrating, you know, storage kind of more complex uh, uh, pulses, uh, and you know they were, and indeed, you know, like the limitation was, you know, basically all of them were limited by this, you know, figure of Marriott optical, which is called optical depth, and. I mean, still uh, up, up to these days, you know, scientists, you know, continue to basically push on this figure of merit. I think there are also kind of new ideas about how to kind of uh, circumvent these limitations. And some of these limitations actually were already pointed out in our PRA paper. In fact, that was the reason why we wrote this PRA paper to begin with. But, you know, for example, you know, there have been some work maybe, you know, two or three years ago by Derek Chang's group where, you know, showed, you know, where, you know, it showed where we can basically, you know, have like a structured, you know, medium, for example, a medium which consists on, on, on atom arrays, you know, it can be much more effective in terms of kind of utilizing this, uh, this optical depth, you know, figure of merit, much better scaling. So, uh, you know, I think this is, you know, once again, how science, you know, develops is a little bit in circles, but every time in a circle, you hopefully come to the higher point, you know, and, you know, we learned something around the time in 2000, but not everything, right? And this, you know, this is, this is an ongoing story, you know, I'd say. Okay, here is a follow-up question on that. Um, several experiment, uh, several experiments have demonstrated light storage where the main conditions imposed by the dark state polarity model are not completely fulfilled. Could you comment on that? So that kind of maybe goes back to this, what we discussed about the extension of the original 
uh, of this original you know work. So where, for example, we started looking for you know, okay, so if you are given the um, you know medium with some properties, how well can you really store the pulse? What's the highest fidelity? So it turns out that you can actually generalize this dark state polariton consideration. So but you know potentially go beyond this kind of adiabatic limit which we considered in the early work and you know i think uh and and i think you know some of these things they sort of branched out and became you know directions on on its own and you know a lot of that is related to the ideas of of you know photon echo you know and and, and things like that so i think this you know and in some cases these approaches are actually more efficient you know better than this adiabatic approach that we considered earlier Okay, thank you. Um, here's a more general question. Can you comment more on the opportunities in quantum optim uh, optomechanics related to your work? So, uh, yeah, so basically quantum optomechanics, as you know, involves basically the interaction uh, between light and mechanical degrees of freedom, basically, which is like phonons, right? And uh, so long as we look and think about uh, the the kind of light, uh, you know, weak pulses of light, kind of in a linear regime. So I mean, it turns out that this kind of process, or at least you know, part of the process of interaction between uh, mechanical degrees of freedom and photonic degrees of freedom, is actually very similar to the interaction between photonic degrees of freedom and let's say this. Um, the the atomic excitations and so basically the the specific work that I'm thinking about are things like optomechanical uh, I think optomechanically induced transparency it's it's called so this were one these were wonderful experiments that people uh, for example like Oscar Painter has you know have done you know really you know, showing how one can control the interaction between light and matter. And matter in that case is really, you know, photonic kind of degrees of freedom. And, and people are now thinking about applications of these things we could absolutely not imagine. So for example, one direction there is to really try to build an optical interface for superconducting qubits, you know? So, you know, uh, certainly in 2000, we did not, you know, well, we didn't know, no one knew what superconducting unit you know, can be, right? So, and, you know, so, but, you know, I think a lot of these kind of, you know, foundational concepts are, are related, you know, to each other. Maybe, maybe just to add on, uh, I mean, this, uh, the, the, the key concept of, of these, of the polaritons is just the linear mapping between uh, different degrees of freedom. So, so therefore, in, in, in some sense, it's a coupling of, of, well, uh, oscillators and the oscillators can be light and the other oscillator can be a mechanical oscillator so the the, the the basic principles just relies on the on this linearity of of this uh, uh, polariton transfer but you know of course let's be also fair that this is not our i mean this concept has been known previous to our work so i mean perhaps the only thing that we added really to this knowledge is that if you control these properties of this coupling dynamically, you know, some good things can happen. I don't know whether it's a fair statement, but you know, that's a Yeah. Okay, um, Misha, you mentioned DLCZ protocol for quantum repeater. And I know uh, that is one of the motivation for uh, developing quantum memory. Uh, can you give us the outlook on the, uh, the quantum repeater um, in that area? So, okay, that's maybe another kind of interesting story about how science, you know, has kind of developed. So basically, um, shortly around the time we, you know, we have done our, the theoretical work that we have been uh, talking about, um, actually Peter Zoller uh, visited uh, ITEMP and we started, you know, and he read uh, about our papers, uh, our papers and we started talking about, you know, kind of various extensions and, um, uh, of this, and that's how, for example, the work on on Rydberg blockade has started. You know, but at that time, at that time, we also have started looking at this 
uh, I, you know, asking question, what if, you know, you just have linear optics, you know, can you kind of use it for an end memory? Can you use this for something kind of useful for, you know, can, you know, can it be useful for humankind, as I would say. And so this is kind of, and that's kind of the idea for this DLCZ protocol where Luming, Duan and, and Ignacio together sort of we have developed, you know, some of these, you know, ideas, how to entangle atomic ensembles, how to read out the memory. Um, and um, at the time, the big motivation was to really kind of try to enable relatively near term implementation of these ideas. And indeed, uh, you know, this stimulated a wave of, 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 of subsequent, you know, experiments, some of them very successful. But at that same time, we also kind of realized that there are some limitations. So for example, if you just have linear optics um, for all your quantum operations and for repeaters, you need things like purification, entanglement purification, um, entanglement connection. So it turns out that if, if you just use linear optics, you essentially, you know, put all of your overhead, you know, which is kind of usually you, requ you require to make quantum, for example, gates and so on. You put it all into the photodetector clicks. And so what it means is that your, if your system has certain, un, you know, inefficiency, for example, if your process of light pulse retrieval is not 100% efficient, if your photodetector is not 100% efficient, this would actually limit this um, kind of the performance of this protocol, you know, quite substantially. And we have realized it already kind of in the mid 90s and actually that's, you know, this realization was kind of the inspiration to start looking for systems where we could, you know, at least perform a minimal number of the, of the quantum gates. So for example, that's how my group started thinking about NV centers for quantum repeaters. Uh, and, uh, um, and actually, you know, we started, you know, and we and others like group of Ronald Hansen, for example, started really pushing this kind of these ideas forward, you know, you know, a few years later, you know, in our group we realized that maybe in these centers is not the best possible system either. And we started looking at other, 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 other color centers. So, and, you know, for example, just this past um, spring, you know, uh, you know, we, published a paper where the, for the first time we actually could use one of these memory nodes. So in this case, it's just a single atom and it's not an atomic ensemble. And it's actually, uh, it's an uh, impurity called silicon vacancy center, which is kind of integrated into sophisticated, you know, a diamond, you know, nanophotonic device, which is interfaced super efficiently with conventional fiber. So, and this, I believe it's really a first work in which the the um, uh, the memory node was used at least in a proof of concept setting, you know, to kind of extend communication range. So I must say I'm now very optimistic about really kind of pushing these ideas forward. But what you see is again how this original idea stimulated something. So here science really took a few turns, you know. And there were several generations of, you know, kind of blood and sweat of, you know, graduate students, extremely creative, combined with pushing the frontier forward, with coming up with new ideas, you know, coming up from different directions, quantum optics, quantum information, material science control, you know, uh, but that's what it takes to make these things work, right? And, you know, in a way, this was stimulated by this originally uh, ideas that we are talking about, you know. Thank you. And that actually naturally connects to the next question from another audience. Um, in your opinion, will these kind of mem quantum memories be in an industrial process? And if yes, when? Um, I guess that's related to uh, say miniaturization, fabrication of um, certain device that we can use for quantum memories. Uh, do you have any comments on that, Michael? Well, I guess that uh, one of the, the uh, issues which one has to address there is that, that, that the typical communication lines are, are uh, uh, telecom communication wavelengths. Uh, 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 they have to be 
match to uh, uh, memories and 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 devices which make actually the the uh, uh, manipulation of the, in, uh, the of the information. So it's not just about the memory. It's also that you want to uh, uh, store the information in the, in the degrees of freedom which uh, uh, later on can be manipulated. So there are ideas of uh, uh, transferring um, optical fo photons into uh, into say uh, um, microwave photons, which can then be connected to a to uh, microwave st strip line resonators, where you can make. Uh, 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 make uh, logical operations with, with, with qubits. So um, I, I think there is a lot of, uh, I'm just uh, storing in an atomic vapor. Uh, yes, we can use uh, effects like, like uh, Rydberg interactions, but that is all things which are uh, uh, on, the, on the, I would say on the, on the level of, of science, not on the level of, of industrial applications. So if you really go in, in the direction of industry, you have to also um, uh, uh, consider the uh, all of these uh, 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 constraints that that uh, light is transferred uh, uh, if, if not in free space it's transferred by a fiber so you have to to match uh, what exists there to to um, the, 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 the 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 proper uh, device platforms and and uh, um, so uh, on the industrial level um, I don't know on the other hand um, uh, the free space experiments are, are, are uh, looking quite interesting, and, and uh, there are the, the uh, uh, network lines and, and through satellites, and that might be a, a different story. Uh, I'm I'm actually much more optimistic <laughs> so, <laughs> on, on on various fronts. So, for example, you know, um, like what I just mentioned, the ideas where we actually Okay, I mean, it, these ideas are kind of inspired by this early work. They are not, you know, 100% kind of following that path, but inspired by early work involving, for example, you know, color centers, you know, which are basically already integrated in devices, which, which, are, which are coupled to fibers with efficiency close to 100%, you know, and as I'm talking about system level efficiency, and that's what it takes to really compete with conventional quantum cryptography, you know, so... I, I think the idea, the, the systems like that, you know, I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of exciting, you know, potential applications of them, and they could very well be industrial. But even if we talk about, you know, atoms, you know, I could, you know, like, you know, one of the kind of follow-up of this, you know, kind of all of these developments, you know, was the work that, you know, that 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 Mark and and Antoine Brave and you know our group has done, which. By now, I would say this, you know, at, you know, Rydberg Atom Arrays is, you know, one of the world's leading platform for quantum information processing. And if you really start seriously thinking how you would like to interface this platform, you know, with the outside world in a quantum way, you know, basically building networks of these quantum processors, quantum computers, these ideas of dark state polaritons will be very, very relevant. So. I could very well imagine in future that you know the that you know companies running neutral atom you know quantum information you know hardware would make use of these effects to connect with other atomic systems but also other other different types of systems like for example you know superconducting qubits you know so and you know I, I think at that at this point there is really no substitute to that you know so um so if we are serious about ever, you know, quantum technologies kind of making an impact, you know, uh, on kind of real world, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so, maybe right. Um, yeah, time is almost uh, there, so I might take advantage of this opportunity to ask you a question from my perspective, my background is on code atom, and recently there have been development on optical tweezers and a micro trap that one can uh, trap just a few atoms with high fidelity. And do you see those new techniques being applied to um, this quantum optics or quantum memory, this field at all? Well, I would say there's, there's in, in addition to the application for quantum information, which we mostly talked about now, there's also, I think, in, in a different direction, which, which I find personally very fascinating, 
is uh, that these manipulation tools which we have at hand, uh, given by the by the polaritons, by the by, the, by this concept of dark state polaritons, uh, is uh, uh, is is a is a very powerful and interesting tool to connect this with just elementary questions of few and many body physics. And uh, uh, I mean, for example, the interaction of of uh, if you combine a photon with Rydberg excitation, you suddenly make it. Uh, make it uh, strong and long-range interacting. Then there's a, a lot of interesting uh, uh, many-body physics resulting from that. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the combination of these fundamental questions with, with uh, uh, trapped atoms, I see as a, as a, as a, as a very interesting uh, direction. Uh, I mean, on the, on the quantum information side, Certainly, one of the issues in these in these quantum memories is is in, in gaseous media at least is motion, atomic motion, and and as soon as you can uh, uh, reduce this effect, um, uh, uh, then you 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 have a big pay of that. Been, been some experiments in my Bloch group a couple of years ago, which which showed that. Yes, on the other hand, the, the price you pay is that that uh, the, the densities don't get that high. Um, uh, they are always two sides, but I certainly think that that is a very promising direction to think of the tools which we have in manipulating light and the interaction of or the coupling of light to matter and manipulating matter itself. And that this is, as I see, as a very fruitful direction. Thank you very much. Mark, do you have... Yeah, sorry. I can just echo it. And, you know, I would say that you know, I, I feel that these ideas will be very important, you know, for both, you know, pushing the frontier of quantum information processing, kind of computation simulations, you know, not just for, for networking purposes, but also improving, you know, readout of, 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 uh, of, of the states, right? But at the same time, you know, also there is a kind of very active work now extending this, you know, relatively old ideas in combination with atom arrays to do things like um, uh, realize things like, for example, quantum metasurfaces. You know, the metasurface is by itself a big field, but it actually turns out that, you know, you, you can implement this kind of polariton type ideas just with one kind of single sheet of atoms. Right, so long as atoms are ordered, you know, properly, you know, positioned in the array, and the separation is small enough, you know, and this is actually a work led by Effie Shamon and Rivka Beckenstein, and actually also in collaboration with Susanna Yellen's group. So, you know, so these kind of things potentially could be very important tools for both studying physics, kind of many body physics, but also creating complex and tangled states of light and matter and you know I, I i you know in a way it's still a very active research field an exciting research field okay. thank you very much um mark do you have something to say no i think our our time is about up uh, maybe just one final kind of broader question um the two of you collaborated on this work at an early relatively early point in your careers when you were both postdocs, I believe, and um, perhaps you have some advice to some of the younger people in the audience about doing research at that early stage of their career. Any any thoughts? Well, I think it's a, a extremely uh, uh, important and it's decisive for 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 the career to develop at an early point independent ideas, and uh, and uh, for that collaborations. Uh, uh, a key, so uh, always look for for good ideas in in collaborations, and uh, if you can manage to even I mean our the nice thing about our field is that that the the uh, connection between the theory and experiment is so close, so if you able to to use uh, this in in a, a fruitful way as it has been done and and that for in, in that example I think that's the uh, the best thing uh, uh, one can do, and which should just uh, follow this, develop their own sorts, and follow their own sorts, develop uh, the the connections and the and the and the uh, collaborations. So, yeah. So actually, so maybe I can also offer a little bit of my perspective because even though this work was really a kind of a collaboration between between us, you know, Ma Michael 
was really my mentor, you know, during I learned quantum optics from him. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, and kind of, the, the, I guess the thing which I actually often tell kind of my students is if you start working on something, you should really, you know, try to become world's top expert in the subject and really kind of think about it from different perspectives and really understand it from different points of view. And this PRA paper was kind of like that. It's a little bit I learned from Michael that, you know, we didn't really have to write it. You know, we already had results. There was this famous experiment. Why did you, but you know, it was kind of, okay, let's get some insight, a little bit more insight. Let's dig deeper, you know? And at that point, once you can do that, you know, you should not be afraid to go outside of your field and try to you know look at new learn new things apply this kind of ideas to new uh kind of directions and and systems and fields of research and because you have this deep knowledge in one of these fields that really allows you to kind of broaden and kind of learn as you go and still do things that in other fields people really find amazing you know how do you how do you come up with this idea we don't understand you know so that's maybe a little bit of my advice, and that's what I learned from Professor Fleshel. Well, thank you very much, Mikhail and Misha. Let me just mention, uh, while there are still people online, that there will be a third one of these interviews on August 5th, 11 a.m., with Masyaj Lewinstein and Misha Ivanov. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much for today. That was very interesting and stimulating, and uh, thanks for taking the time and sharing your memories about and thoughts about this. Well, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.